I've just pressed record. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to a Zoom session on uh, risk assessment forms. Uh, I'm going to run through uh, looking at a couple of old systems and then looking at the forms that are the current best practice um, templates that we have now. Uh, and so hopefully everyone can see the shared screen. Um, we'll just get started. Uh, so if we stay on mute for the session, um, uh, Catherine will keep an eye on chat because uh, there might be some questions you have along the way um, and there's not that many of us today. Um, if Catherine keeps an eye on chat, I can just answer those where they're appropriate. So just um, any questions into there and we'll allow time at the end to, um, to ask any questions. Uh, so the overarching messages for today um, we're going to be looking at uh, meeting what meeting good practice involves uh, and the key things there are um, making sure you're either using the current format or that the format that you are using is doing the same job uh, and we'll, we'll look at what that uh, format involves as we go through today. Uh, that you understand the process that you're using and that you're ensuring that everyone involved in the activity understands and most importantly, can competently implement and monitor the controls that you're putting in place. So some key tools that we're going to touch on today. Uh, these are out of the, um, the toolkit that sits on the EON's website and we'll, I'll show you exactly where that is um, at the end three tools and an uh, overarching um, system. So the safety management plan template. Okay, so what's changed over the last few years? Uh, in a minute, I'm gonna flick off this PowerPoint and um, share some examples with you. Uh, you may be familiar with RAMs and SAPs as two of the terms that are often used around risk assessment. Uh, and today we're going to have a look at both of those and then compare them to the new format and identify what's missing from these two old formats. Now these forms are still, um, if you have been using them and you're still using them, they contain lots of valuable information. So it's not uh, that we just throw these out and start again with a blank form, but that we might transition to a more current template. Or that you might do some work to these templates so that they do the same job as the current template does. So there's a couple of options in there. So I'm just gonna sh stop sharing that screen and pop you over there. And So hopefully, now can you see uh, a template for a RAMS form and a template for a SAPS? You can? Great. All right, so if we look first at the RAMS form, um, this isn't a one that's been filled out, but you may well have some in your schools that look like this. Uh, the issue with RAMS forms in this format um, is once they're filled out, they become, or they can become overly complicated. And it's very hard to see the links between the, in this case, the undesirable events, the causal factors and the management strategies. And you can't get a clear flow of the information. There's often too much information on there to really identify what the significant things are in that form, the things that you really need to be managing and have under control for the entire activity to make sure uh, you're all safe. The forms don't allow a way of, uh, of assessing the significance of the harm. And they also don't really allow a clear way of assigning the responsibility for implementing these strategies and monitoring them to people. Uh, so, that's some issues, historic issues with the RAMS form. With the SAPS form, 
It's a much clearer layout and lots of schools have used these and continue to use these because uh, it's much easier for people to understand with the questions across the top and the nice uh, way they run across the page. This uh, SAPS form has much more in common with the format uh, that we have, uh, we're currently promoting. Um, and that it's the same format across the page. But this historic SAPS form is still missing um, a way of assessing what the really significant things that can go wrong are and what could really cause, you know, what the big problems are in there. It's missing those, uh, that key aspect of assessing the significance of each one of the what could go wrongs that you have identified. Uh, it does a good job of adding in uh, whose responsibility it is and when that will be done by. And it also uh, has the emergency plan in there. Um, and that's an important point that I'm going to come back to as well. So we'll just get rid of these now. Oh, sorry. And I'll bring up the current format that we're working with. So this is the current um, form number two out of the toolkit. And you can see immediately it has lots of similarities with that SAPS form that we were just looking at. If we look at this example here, there's a couple of things that are immediately different. It's still got um, the question under here, but that's got a big harm up here. So that's really what, what could go wrong? What is it? What's the harm that that is going to cause? Next thing, why is it going to happen? What is the hazard? And then here is the new concept that's introduced in this template, the risk rating. And this risk rating here is asking you to think about the harm and the hazard and think about how serious those two things are. So if that harm occurred, what's the risk? there. Then you've got um, some controls that you need to identify and the controls are talking about how to prevent this hazard from occurring and therefore stopping the harm. We don't need to worry too much, I'll, I'll touch on what the eliminate and minimize um, mean later on in the session, but this is really about how you're going to manage this hazard. A column where you pop in who's going to do it and who's going to check it along the way? So during your activity, who is really going to be responsible? Uh, and you might have a number of different people in here. If we look at this first example. This is something that needs to happen before you go um, to the particular activity. Uh, and so that might be uh, the EOTC coordinator that actually checks those things for you or the teacher in charge of the overall, if it was a camp you were going on, you know, the overall teacher in charge. Whereas these, some of these other things might be the staff member that is in charge of that particular group on that day might be in charge of checking those things. And at the end of the table, we've got a residual risk rating. And this is where you consider what the risk will be after the controls have been put in place or as the controls are put in place. So this risk rating is before any controls. This one is after your controls are in place. And you should see movement between those two. This one down here should be lower than this one here. We'll go on to talk about the risk rating more um, later on in the session, but at the stage, we'll just flick through the whole form so you get an overview of what else is in here. Uh, this overnight camping is just in here as an example, so you can kind of see some of the things you're thinking about. Uh, you'll see down here, some of these uh, categories or hazards have been identified as having a lower risk initially. And this information up here can be very well, reasonably generic. Um, you go through and edit it for your particular event. Um, 
but there might be things that are particular to a, a particular site on the day. And you might be going, um, if we use the camp example or a tramping example, you might be going to multiple sites within that one event. Um, so for example, uh, you could have in here uh, that the first site, uh, oh, if we think about the fire example, maybe at the first site that you're going to, uh, there it's right close to the river, so, um, but there's lots of dry grass and things around the actual campsite. So around fire, the management of that at that particular site would be lighting the, in any fires down on the river in the stones. Whereas at the next site, you might know that there is a permanent um, outside fireplace that you could use. So this is the area where you'd note those types of things. Hazards on the day. Uh, this is where you think particularly about your participants and also the particular um, environment that you might be going to and then how you can manage those things. So it takes the form from being reasonably generic down to being particular to that place in that day. The next part of the form goes on to look at supervision requirements. And this used to be a separate form, but we're now recognizing how important supervision and your staffing is uh, in managing your risk. Um, we've combined these two aspects so that you really are considering staffing as part of your risk assessment and your planning uh, for those controls. And you're really matching your staffing to the controls that you're putting in place. Uh, an example of that might be if you were doing river crossing, for example, and one of your controls in, at the top of the form was that you were going to use the approved Mountain Safety Council river crossing technique, spot on as a control. When you come down to this part of the form, you would need to consider, have you got a staff member that is competent in actually implementing that river crossing method? Uh, if the answer is no, then something needs to change. Either your staffing, the activity, uh, or where you're doing the activity. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's really vitally important to consider the competencies you have and to look at, uh, to really ensure that you're outlining the roles and matching the competencies of those staff to what you're expecting them to be able to do. There is a couple of forms that can help in that process. There's form number five, which we won't look at today, um, that is a way of collecting staff competency. But another important piece of this part of the work is to actually think of the activity competencies. So regardless of your staffing or who's going on the activity, if you know you're doing uh, within your school, your going tramping, uh, you have got a swimming activity, and uh, you're doing some mountain biking. A process where you work through uh, for mountain biking, that, uh, that activity requires these competencies or qualifications for a leader. Doesn't matter uh, who the leader is at that stage, but you're taking the activity and identifying what competencies or qualifications that activity needs to run safely. Uh, and that's something that you can do well ahead of time when you know, uh, or you have a general idea about the activities that your school will do across the year. And it really helps you when you get to this stage and all of a sudden you have staff names down in this role and name column. It allows you to look and say, oh, mountain biking, this is the competency we need, have these staff. Uh, that are saying they're going on this activity or delivering this activity, have they got the skills, qualifications, and therefore the competency to run this activity appropriately. Uh, next section of this stage of this form looks at uh, 
splitting down and really looking at your group members and including staff in here, so identifying health, behavior, capabilities. Uh, and these three obviously will uh, vary for each group that you take. So really important that you know um, both the staff and the students that are going on that particular activity and uh, that you're thinking about the capabilities that they need uh, to have uh, for that particular activity um, and if they need extra support uh, if they don't have the, the full range of capabilities required and that you're then putting in extra either extra supervision or extra strategies around dealing with those. Uh, number three is where you're basically building a picture of the supervision structure that you're gonna use. And we've really moved away from talking about ratios where you might say I have one staff member to every five kids on this activity to thinking about it in far greater uh, detail around the competency and how your groups work together and the type of skills you need in each group. Uh, so that's a very uh, quick zip through this form. And now we're gonna pop on and have a wee look at uh, a tool that can help you with these two columns, the risk rating column and the residual rating column. And I oh, will just pop that over to the bed. So this is the safety, the EOTC safety management plan template, uh, linked off the EONS website or on TKI and. The first part of it is really around roles and responsibilities and policies. But we'll get, we're going to pop straight down into the procedures and we're going to zip through the start of the procedures all the way to here. Uh, and this table really aims to walk you through a risk management uh, planning and implementation process. Um, that you use with Form 2, the one we've just been looking at. So here we are, here's the risk assessment form right at the start, and you've got five uh, kind of questions or categories to help guide you in your thinking uh, when you're identifying what you should be thinking about in that form. And you, you can see things that we've we talked about when we uh, toured through that form just then. This bit here, the assess which hazards need to be managed is where we start really considering what that uh, first column of risk rating is gonna look like. And we need to consider the consequence and the likelihood. And those two things combined give us the significance and what we're really looking for is to identify the more significant hazards, the ones we really need to pay attention to um, and make sure they're at the top of our mind and we've got really good controls around managing those. And the risk rating matrix um, will help you in doing that. So we'll just sit down out of that table into the risk rating information and a little bit more of an idea here on uh, the categories of likelihood and severity and it's those two things that work together to give you your risk rating and therefore your significance. Now there is multitudes of these tables out there, multitudes of different descriptions um, and uh, we did a lot of work on trying to get the ones that made the most sense, but you'll find lots of other examples. You can find three by three tables, four by four tables, five by three tables, all sorts of things um, out there. Five by five seem to be the most common. And whilst there's different words that you might find in different likelihood levels and different severity ratings, it's the same general idea. 
And the idea is these descriptions allow you to kind of pick where the hazard that you're talking about might fit. Uh, so if we think about the first one that was on that uh, form that we looked at, it was around fire. Um, and so you might think without any controls in place that uh, it's probably, it's, it's possible. Um, I'm not sure it would pop up into the likely, might depend, um, and this is where your group comes into it a bit and you need to consider who you've got as well as where you're going and what you're doing, um, but you're probably somewhere in the possible there. If you go down into the severity table, you think about, well, if we actually manage to start a fire, oh, we're probably up in here. Um, this is definitely a possibility if we didn't have any controls in place that we could um, seriously injure someone with a fire. Uh, you hope you wouldn't have a fatality, but you know, that's always a possibility in there. So we're probably somewhere up in this major critical area. Definitely if we started a large bushfire, um, we're going up into critical. So keeping those in mind, if we pop down to this next bit, we can see, uh, if we look down this column, we're talking about the likelihood, and we thought it was possible. Across the top, we're talking about the severity, and we were kind of considering majoring or critical. So here we are, we find ourselves in high. And that was um, what we had in there before there were any controls in place. So now if we pop back up here and think about what controls we might put in place, we might make sure there is only one place to light a fire, uh, that the students uh, don't bring anything with them that could light a fire, uh, and that we've checked that by having a bag check. Uh, we've also done some education around why we wouldn't be playing with matches uh, in the dry, bushy, grassy environment. And so we're probably moving right down into, it's very unlikely, even probably rare. We could always have um, that one student that uh, you know, is completely random and manages to sneak something onto camp. Uh, but we're moving more into this category here. If we're thinking about strategies that might change severity, might be something like um, having a bucket of water right beside the fire. So if we did um, get a burn, we might be able to move that from a serious injury down to one um, that wasn't as serious because we had a response there really quickly. Most of the time, you are moving in, in the likelihood rather than the severity. And this is where you'll have your biggest ability to move is in controlling the likelihood um, in most cases. Not in all cases, we can definitely move in here um, with different controls as well. So now if we pop back down to the risk assessment matrix, um, you can see we move down into kind of unlikely or rare and we're somewhere in moderate to uh, so we've moved down to kind of the low to medium and by popping those uh, in first of all the high into that um, risk rating before we put any controls in and then either the medium or the low into the residual rating category it's a really clear demonstration that we've by putting those controls in place we're managing the risk by having that high rating in the first category, we're telling our staff and anyone who's using that form that that's something that they really do need to make sure those controls are in place for. This next table here just gives you some really broad ideas around um, if you ended up with these different colors in the end column, your residual risk column, of what you should be thinking about. Um, and, you know, if you end up with extremes in there, really that's unacceptable. Um, so you're looking to change the way you either radically change the way you do the activity 
or look for a completely different activity or different location or different mix of staff. Um, that means that you're reducing that risk level. When you're talking about high risk levels, you, you're really trying to eliminate that risk where possible. Um, and you can read there what that means. Uh, and then medium risk, you're minimizing that risk. And there's a, some ideas on this next table, this hierarchy of control, which explains the difference between eliminating, where you're completely removing that hazard or that ability to access that hazard, compared with minimizing where you're actually um, putting uh, processes in place or administrative controls or, or personal protective equipment in to reduce down the risk, but you're not actually removing it totally. Removing it totally in the fire example would just be not having a fire at all. Um, minimizing it is, the example is where you have the fire that you, um, have controls around that fire that the teacher is managing the lighting of that fire or beside the person lighting those fires. Uh, you might consider, um, I'm just trying to think where the bucket of water would go. Pro it's probably an engineering control. Yeah, somewhere in the, somewhere down in here is your bucket of water, um, if that makes sense. Uh, the important thing to consider here uh, is this little note down the bottom. There's no absolute science to this. It's about um, really think, it's about the process and about thinking through all the different things that are feeding into that activity. Uh, and I think this is really key, um, this team approach. Uh, it's just the absolute best way to go uh, if you once when you're working through this process. So you've got lots of brains coming together, uh, thinking about what controls might be and how they might be put into place. Okay, uh, now let's zip back up to our table here. So we've just talked about assessing uh, and completing the using the risk rating matrix to complete those two colored tables in the form. The next step is, um, and you've actually developed the controls all, already as well, but it's this step here around how they're communicated and implemented. So uh, for some schools, they choose to use form two as the method of communicating those controls. And that's what would go in sort of an event folder or staff would take out into the field. Um, and they'd have done some work and they'd understood uh, what those controls are from that form and just fits into the folder. And that's what they use in the field and they have all that information with them. For some other schools, they um, choose to do that first process but then transfer the information onto a standard operating procedure. And form three is an example that you can use um, for that. Now where standard operating procedures uh, are really good and useful is where you have uh, the same event happening multitudes of times with different staff. Um, so activities on camp are a really good example. Uh, if you go on a camp over three weeks and within that camp, there's a day tramp, um, as this example here, that different staff um, have responsibility for organizing. Uh, a, a standard operating procedure can be a much simpler document to look at and understand than that risk assessment and supervision form. So it's just a different way to communicate the same information and also some other information as well, all into one place. Uh, so if you look at the blue example here, again, this is just one template. There's all sorts of templates for standard operating procedures. Um, and the day tramp is just an example that's been dropped into here to give an idea or a flavor of the type of information you might put in there. But you can see this has got information about lessons, uh, what to check, um, and this is where you'd be picking up in here the major hazards to monitor. These would be the ones that you had identified 
um, as the really significant ones in your risk assessment process. And then these standard operating procedures are the controls um, that you would have in place that all the staff needed to be doing consistently. Uh, and this one also captures some um, equipment that you might need to have in there. It's got a, a section here where to capture that information that is particular to that site. Uh, it probably should say students as well. So that, that particular group of students, because the rest of the information above it is generic, there is always some information that needs to be particular to that group um, on that day. And again, down here too, in the front of mind, the hazards and risks on the day. So you can see here in the example, you know you've got Bob in your group, um, you know there's a slip at a certain place, uh, and because you're going on this particular track, compared with another one that might also be an option, you know that there's an intersection that you have to make sure they stop at. Um, site area maps are, can be um, useful as well when you're dealing with uh, multitudes of staff needing to know um, where particular things are as well. So th those are two ways that you can take that work that you did in the risk assessment and communicate it out and make sure it's implemented. The last part of this process is uh, arguably the most important okay, and that is implementing, both implementing but monitoring that implementation along the way. Uh, so not only is it looking um, at what happened during the event after it's run and assessing that, but it's also during the event. Okay. Constantly keeping your uh, risk assessment eyes on and uh, monitoring and changing controls um, as conditions change during the day or during the activity um, or things happen. The, the ability to be flexible and have that staff competency to manage whatever happens during that activity. Um, and I think an important point here, it goes back to your uh, staffing when you're deciding on your staff competency, is uh, not to be deciding on your staff competency for the activity as normal or business as usual activity, but it's ensuring that your staff competency uh, can deal with the unusual or the emergency that could possibly happen. So really thinking about, have we got uh, a constant eye on what's going on? Have we got the competency uh, in our staff to manage whatever happens during the day? Along those lines, um, one last form to look at, uh, because, the, because the current format that we use uh, got there, um, has separated out the emergency response it's really important that schools don't forget that that's an absolutely vital part of the system. And so form 14 needs to sit alongside uh, either the standard operating procedures or that risk assessment form, whichever one you're using to communicate what's um, required to the staff running the activity. Um, you need this as part of your event um, paperwork and documentation that goes with those staff members. Um, and ideally, um, they're involved in the bits and creating the bits that are, are particular to that activity. Uh, so you can see contact information here, then um, a nice guide through a, a first response to um, first aid. And then down here, this is the things to consider for that particular activity. Um, so for example, uh, if you're going on a tramp, then a missing person, this is where you need to go down through and think about things that for that particular activity, you'd need to do if you were, someone was missing. Um, depending on the activity, 
these things might change. If you're not going to the event in a vehicle, then you know, yeah, that's not relevant to have in there, but something else might be. Um, for example, uh, if, you're, if it's a swimming activity, then you'd need um, a category down or a column down here that deals with what to do in that emergency situation. Okay. Just gonna swap sharing back now. Yeah. Catherine, have we got any questions at this stage? Oh, you're on mute. No, no questions. Okay, so. All right, so um, there might be some questions soon, but uh, just to quickly run through um, the EON's website, uh, EOTC coordinator uh, database button here to join the database. Um, always really appreciated in your local networks. Uh, clearly you're all on that database, so you're here, but uh, no, in your local networks, if you could share and um, get as many people um, onto that uh, database as possible. It would be really appreciated. Um, you know it's a quick and easy process uh, and it really is about um, showing good practice by making sure you're linked in to getting current information. And we've still got about 1,500 schools at least to go uh, there. So there's no shortage of schools that can join. Uh, finding the information that I talked about today uh, in, off the, um, the top here in EOTC management, uh, the Zoom series, this recording will go into here and that's where you register. The forms that we looked at today are in the EOTC SM, SMP template all sit under this column here. If you're moving to the new form um, two, or even uh, thinking about adjusting your RAMs or SAPS forms that you're using currently, the good practice guide lines uh, have some really, oh, they have about 12 examples of activities and the template or the, the guidance is in exactly the same uh, template as form two. So it's really useful to pop into these good practice guides if you're doing things like uh, archery, uh, flat water paddling, um, inland swimming, uh, snorkeling, um, there's about to be one for beach activities, uh, all of those type of activities, that generic guidance is already there for you to edit. So it's, a, it's the start. Um, and what you do is you go through and edit to make it match your activity, and then you think about the residual risk. The initial risk rating has already been done for you, um, but it's that processing and then thinking about the residual risk there. Uh, and I think that's all I wanted to mention off that page. So um, any questions now? There are questions people could just unmute themselves and yes, ask. Yes, absolutely. Not a question. <laughs> I can't believe it's that I explained it that well. <laughs> but anyway, if you have questions that come up later, um, this is my email address down here. And um, I'm really happy to take any questions um, on anything to do with EOTC uh, management at all and um, try and find you the right answer. Thank you. Oh, hi, Sabina. 
Oh, hi. No, no, no. I didn't hear that question. Sorry, Fiona. That's just my colleagues. Um, a bit chatty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so, um, well, that's me then, if there's no questions. Um, but please, yeah, promote the EOTC database and use that um, email address. I'm more than happy to set up little individual Zooms to um, talk about your particular circumstances and, and work through any um, EOTC issues with you. That seems to be working quite well around different schools. Um, so really happy to do that. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Pleasure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hi, Laura.